In this week's video, we'll review updated charts to help us answer the question, is the party over for stocks and gold? To view the video in full screen mode, use this icon in the lower right hand corner of your video player. To improve the clarity of the charts, use this icon in the lower right hand corner of your video player. So weekly chart of the physical gold ETF, ticker symbol GLD. This is as of Friday, September 30th, a week ago today. These four exponential moving averages are generic and they're chosen for illustrative purposes only. They are not used by the model. However, the model does use a cluster that's very, very similar to the one shown here. Both the master market model and the ETF scoring system have a segment that asks questions solely about moving averages. It asks 207 questions. Here's an example of possibly what four of them might look like. Is the slope of the 17 week exponential moving average positive or negative? And we would ask the same question about all three moving averages. As of September 30th, these boxes were getting ones. They were being checked. Yes, that's a positive and rising slope on all of these moving averages. Out of the 207 questions that we asked on multiple time frames a week ago, GLD scored on a scale of zero to 181, which roughly means 81% of the 207 questions were coming back bullish or positive. It's not really that because they're weighted a little bit differently, but for the most part, it tells you that 81% of the 207 questions are favorable. 81% is firmly in do nothing, leave it alone territory and volatility to ignore. The model helps us hold positions. If you don't ride out volatility from time to time, it's nearly impossible to make money. Why did we hold our positions like GLD a week ago? And why did we cut them over the past five trading sessions? Let's fast forward a week to Friday, October 7th. Now our aggregate score about the 207 questions, a weighted score dropped to 53 on a scale of zero to 100. And you can see in this case, now all four of these hypothetical questions with these generic moving averages have flipped from four ones to four zeros. What does a score of 53 tell us? Well, from an experience standpoint, a score of 53 is right in the middle of the scale and it tells you exactly what you would guess. GLD is at a possible inflection point. So GLD could recover from this type of score and rally sharply, or it could take another leg down and see this score drop significantly below 50. The ETF scoring system and the rules tell us exactly what we need to do when it drops from 81 to 53. And that's exactly what we did on Friday. That's a risk management move. We still like gold, but a score of 53 tells us we're at a possible mathematical inflection point. And our exposure a week ago was too high for this score. We're not willing to hold that high of a percentage allocation to GLD with a score like 53. We were willing to hold it with a score like 81. How do we address it? We reduced the position. To implement a system like this, you really shouldn't have an emotional attachment or a rooting interest to any position. Therefore, we really are not rooting for GLD to go up or down. What we're rooting for is for us to be allocated properly and for us to execute properly based on what the evidence is telling us. Right now, the market is telling us that GLD is at a possible inflection point and we needed to reduce our exposure a little bit. If you ask why we reduced the other positions in our portfolio this week, the answer would basically be the same. The scores from last Friday to this Friday dropped and therefore our allocations needed to be adjusted to get back in line with the weight of the evidence. These two charts, the different look from the 30th to the seventh provide some visuals to accompany this post from October 6th on short takes. If you haven't seen it, you can Google this title here. 
an extremely important mathematical and fundamental tenet of the CCF market model or any multiple asset class trend following system is you have to look at multiple asset classes and you have to remove all of your bias. If a buy signal comes for gold, it doesn't matter whether you particularly like gold or feel comfortable owning gold. If the math says own gold in a system like this, you own gold. If the math says to reduce your exposure in a system like this, you don't question it, you execute. Relative to stocks and bonds and more traditional investments, the gold market is relatively small and it's not really promoted. And you may have been told that gold is a stupid investment. Well, let's look at an example of why we consider gold to be one of many options and why we are willing to invest in it. This chart here from stockcharts.com shows the S&P 500 in red here. It's January 4th, 1999. Left side of your screen, right side of your screen is August 23rd, 2011. And what this does is shows the percent change between point A and point B. It's very, very difficult for us to consider gold to be a stupid investment when you can get something like this. Between January 4th, 1999 and August 23rd, 2011, gold went up 550%. What did the S&P 500 do over the same period? It lost 5.53%. That may seem a little irrational at first blush, so let's look at some charts. S&P 500, 1999 here, January 4th, 1999 to August 23rd, 2011. This is a weekly chart. If I draw a line point to point between 1999 and 2011, you can see the slope of the line is down. Therefore, over a period that lasts more than 10 years, the S&P 500 index basically went nowhere. How did physical gold or dollar sign G-O-L-D do over the exact same period on a chart like this? This is the exact same time period, 1999, 2011 here. If the math tells us currencies are the place to be, we need to be there. If the math tells us bonds are the place to be, we need to be there. If the math tells us silver is the place to be, we need to be there, why? because you can get massive trades like this and gains. And if you don't take the trade, you're going to miss a huge gain. You, these trends emerge from time to time in the commodity markets. And we've had some recent volatility in gold and our default when we have the data that we have is to try to hold it. Why? Because we know Gold is extremely volatile. So to capture this 550% gain, look at all of the volatility you would have had to endure and all of the emotional swings and balance swings in your account. Gold and especially silver and gold mining stocks tend to be volatile. We know that going in. Gold miners are very volatile. That's why we have a small position sizing in it. Silver, very volatile, small position size to offset the known before we buy it volatility. How do we try to deal with all this in the model? Well, let's use an example that we've covered in recent weeks. How about if we put the 30-week moving average, the 40-week moving average, and the 50-week moving average on this chart? You can see for the most part, this has a full bore bullish look from point A to point B, telling us the vast majority of this volatility, if I'm only using this as my one input, is classified as volatility to ignore. The model uses multiple inputs, and many of them are shorter than this time frame, but we can use this for illustrative purposes. And you can see, this is a very frustrating period in here with basically a giant whipsaw a frustrating period here and markets basically work the same across all asset classes the longer we're frustrated and the longer we go sideways the bigger the move that we tend to get the longer that we're frustrated and the longer we go sideways the bigger the move that we tend to get the longer that we're frustrated and the longer we go sideways the bigger the move that we tend to get 
we know all too well that we've been frustrated and going sideways for quite some time. We also know that these type of looks are turning. They look like this now, and they look like this now. They don't tell us what's going to happen next. They just tell us that the probabilities have improved. And look at all of the frustration and emotional swings in here. It is a normal part of trend following and markets. We can't eliminate volatility with the model. The model only helps us discern between volatility to ignore and volatility to respect. This is a long-term giant mess. Could the model have helped in this case? Using our generic for illustrative purposes only, weekly moving averages, we can see full bore bullish look, full bore bearish, full bore bullish, full bore bearish, full bore bullish, for the most part during all of these long-term trends. It's fairly easy to see that the math can be helpful if you're using the right inputs and the more important thing is if you're executing properly. It's a lot harder to actually do in the real world than it looks when you're looking backwards on a chart. One of the ways that you can make mistakes when you get pullbacks and inevitable drawdowns and balance fluctuations in your account is to either be watching the market too closely or watching your account balances and your position balances too closely. We like to go to third parties for these type of opinions so they're not biased. This is from the fine folks at Pension Partners on August 11th, 2014. This is not open to debate. Studies have shown that the more frequent an investor checks their account balances, the more over time they dramatically underperform nearly every single part of the investable landscape. The reason is basically stress and you're too close to the day-to-day -day noise. If we know in advance that there's going to be stressful periods, drawdowns, and day-to-day -day noise, and we know how we're going to try to discern between volatility to ignore and volatility to respect, then it is important to focus on what we can control. We can't control the volatility, but we can control our attitude, our emotions, and our ability to execute within the context of what we're using to make decisions. Gold showing some deterioration as we covered earlier in the video, and we think it's at somewhat of a mathematical inflection point. We still like gold long term. In fact, we just reduced our exposure. We didn't eliminate it. We may have to eliminate it. Time will tell. If this score drops below 50 and stays there next week, we may have to get rid of all our gold. We'll just take it day by day and really week by week and see where we are in another seven days. In terms of the fundamental reasons to be interested or open to owning gold, here is a quote from Stanley Fisher from the Federal Reserve, talking about longer term shifts. If some of the forces behind these shifts prove to be quite persistent, then we could be stuck in a new long run equilibrium characterized by sluggish growth and recurrent reliance on unconventional monetary policy. Money printing, QE, zero rates, helicopter money, there are all types of possibilities. Gold can act as a hedge against debasement of paper currencies. When the Fed talks about interest rates being lower for longer and seeing this new paradigm shift where the natural rate for interest rates is lower than it used to be and somewhat of that neutral or natural rate what that basically says is it's not holding the economy back nor is it particularly stimulative and typically during an expansion they raise rates back up towards the natural rate and then eventually it allows them to lower it well, if the natural rate is lower, then they're having trouble raising rates. One of the things they rarely talk about is the amount of debt 
that's in the system. They don't want to spook the debt markets. This is a CNBC article from this week. Global debt balloons to all time high of 152 trillion. When low interest rates have encouraged both governments, individuals and companies to take on increasing amounts of debt. And if you think about it, if I have a lot of debt and I have to roll over that debt, so I have a bond that matures, I have to get somebody else to buy a bond to roll over the debt. If interest rates are rising and debt levels are at all time highs, that means the debt service burden will go up significantly if interest rates go up. This is another reason why the neutral or natural rate for interest rates tends to be lower than it was in the past. It's going to be very, very difficult to raise rates with all of this debt in the system. And that's a big reason why the Fed is so tentative to raise interest rates. A couple of takeaways from this week from a discipline perspective. The discipline in the long run is what enables you to execute properly. And we really need two major types of discipline. Type one, leave it alone, which is not easy to do during volatile periods. But if the math says leave it alone, leave it alone. Type two, when the math says it's time to take action, then we take action according to the rules. We saw that a week ago, the discipline to do nothing this week, the discipline intra-week to wait to see how the week played out and then to execute properly. So a week ago, we have an example of discipline, volatility to ignore so we can stay invested. And this week, we have an example of the discipline required when we see some form of volatility to respect. In this case, the volatility to respect for physical gold wasn't telling us to dump gold. It was just telling us to reduce our exposure. I just want to provide some big picture updates in terms of how things look for the stock market on October 7th. This is as of 3.04 p.m. This is the S&P 500. This is our 50-day moving average here in blue and our 200-day moving average in red. And we know from past videos that this is a full bore bearish look where price is typically below both moving averages. Blue is below red and the slopes of both are down. You can see here in the early stages of the dot com bust, we get that full bore bearish look. This is a high risk look. The present day really doesn't look anything like this. In fact, if we just look at the slope of the 200 day moving average, it's turning back up. It looks more like a bullish turn in 2009 or a bullish turn in 2003. If it morphs into a look like this, then the math will catch it and our concerns would increase. We don't anticipate that and we don't have that right now. We always ask the question, are we prudently allocated based on the evidence in hand? Are we prudently allocated based on the evidence in hand? The answer here is probably yes. Here it's probably I'm not so sure. Here it's no. I have to start making some changes because the evidence is now shifting over to volatility to respect. A few weeks back, we looked at the S&P 500 relative to the VIX. How does that look today? Hasn't really changed at all. Our MACD still looks good with black above red and black above zero as of 3.16 p.m. on October 7th, calendar year 2016. Here's our long-term and frustrating consolidation box here. This is actually now four weeks ago. This is the big plunge. Let's fast forward to Friday, October 7th at 3.18 p.m. We have the bullish breakout here above the box, and now we're kind of just hanging around as the Fed goes from we're never going to raise rates again to we may raise rates again. So the market is starting to react to changing expectations relative to interest rates. And that's basically what asset class behavior told us this week. We tweeted that in the middle of the week. 
basically what happened, the probability for what the market is baking in in terms of a rate hike in December went up fairly significantly this week due to stronger than expected economic data. Coming into the week, we were around a 40 to 50% kind of coin toss range for raising rates in December. Now we're probably closer to a 70% probability that the Fed will raise rates in December. Of course, that probability will change as new information comes to light. And there's a lot of economic data to be released between now and the December 2016 meeting. For now, this is holding above the box. These are our generic long-term 30, 40, 50 week moving averages. This is as of 3.20 p.m. on October 7th, 2016. Right now, using this as a illustrative example, all of this is volatility to ignore. And there's no question that this over here looks more like this bullish period here than this bearish period here. The probability of really bad things happening is higher with a look like this and then bad things did happen than the present day look that we have on October 7th. It's a long-term NYSE weekly that we've been looking at. This is the peak 2007. This is the financial crisis. We're still holding above what once acted as resistance may now act as support. And this is a, a retest of support here. And for now, the retest is passing. What happens in the future falls into the to be determined category. We'll learn something either way. If we stay above it, it leans bullish. If we drop back below it and stay below it, the longer we stay below it, the more concerning it would become. There's no question it's been a frustrating period, but these types of periods are not that uncommon when the Fed is trying to change policy, especially when you're trying to move rates off of basically a zero floor. That's very, very difficult to do, and the markets are trying to adjust to that. This is the MYSE composite. This is a daily. This is as of October 7th at 3.08 p.m. Unfortunately, we have had a mess here inside of this box and price has really gone nowhere. In fact, the MYSE or broad market is lower today than it was in July of 2014. We do know that if we execute, typically frustrating periods or difficult markets are followed by easier markets depending upon which way things break. Here are some examples of those frustrating periods. Frustrating periods and sideways periods are not that uncommon. This one's been a little harder because it's been very volatile inside a wide box and it's lasted for a long period of time. But we know if we continue to use the data and the concepts that we've discussed here from our perspective and using our method, that if we pay attention to the hard evidence and try to put the day-to-day -day fluctuations and balance swings on the back burner and focus on execution, managing off of this look is a lot, lot easier than trying to manage off of this look in isolation. The same can be said for the stock market. This is very, very stressful and hard. This is still very, very stressful and difficult. It's just a little bit easier because we have a guidepost to help us discern between that volatility to ignore and volatility to respect. The difficult part of this is keeping your emotions in check and executing properly. And the only way we can execute properly is if we head into next week with that always important, flexible, unbiased, and open mind. How do we track all of this and convert it into a usable and actionable format in a reasonable amount of time the sub-models, we answer binary questions, some of them manually done, some of them programmed in Excel, and we also enter in unbiased and hard data. The sub-models allow us to get a handle on the market's current profile, and the master CCM market model then looks at the current profile, compares it to past profiles, and recommends a prudent allocation between risk assets such as stocks 
and conservative assets such as bonds. Conservative assets can consist of cash, bonds, currencies, or any number of investment options. If you'd like to learn more about the market model or our money management services, you can visit our website, follow along on Twitter, Facebook, read our blog, Short Takes, or watch past videos on the Shivako Capital Channel on YouTube. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any security or any related financial instruments, nor should any of the content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.